You are listening to Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Truth with the power to live it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I have a victory report. Brother Raul's brother, Rafael, got baptized in Jesus' name after the conference in Mexico. Praise the Lord, my brother. Amen, which is the perfect victory report for tonight because I'm preaching about brothers tonight. See how the Lord knew that I didn't have anything like entertaining and he decided to send me an illustration. Let's turn to Mark chapter number one. It's such a joy and pleasure to come to this house of the Lord with all of you guys. It's an honor to serve the Lord together with you. God is so good to us. And we spend, it's just a, it's such a, a privilege and a wonderful thing to be able to spend some time in the Word of the Lord together. We have been looking at the Gospel of Mark, and today we're starting at verse 16, chapter number 1. And as he, speaking of Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men they immediately left their nets and followed him when they had gone a little further from there he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother who were also in the boat mending their nets and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and with the hired servants and went after him teaching about brothers tonight somebody say in Jesus name I bless you you may be seated hallelujah I am going to uh, attempt to be uh, very concise tonight and we will look at this passage in the of the scripture last week we spoke about the beginning of Jesus's ministry where he begins to preach for the first time after his temptation in the wilderness after his baptism by John uh, he begins to preach and he has no disciples yet we talked about how uh, the the memories that are there are not the the detailed memories of an individual but kind of the story of people who heard about it but uh, we weren't necessarily there to record their own thoughts uh, he preached two things he preached repentance and he preached that you should repent of your sins and he preached that you should believe uh, that the kingdom of the Lord was at hand you should look to see the kingdom of the Lord that's all last week uh, he uh, is uh, now a public figure it doesn't take long when crowds are coming to hear. It doesn't take long to, uh, long to get on everybody's radar screen, so to speak, if you're having lots of people come and listen to you. Uh, and very quickly, he has become a public figure. Uh, he is now beginning the recruiting of his disciples. And he starts with these two sets of two brothers that he finds working on the Sea of Galilee. Let me very quickly give you some information on them so when you read things they say later, you'll kind of have a character to go along with the words or at least some information about them to go along with, uh, with the later mentions of them in the Gospel of Mark. Very quickly, uh, now Simon or Peter, we know him as Peter, but at this point uh, he is Simon. Uh, in fact, it was Jesus who called him Peter. Uh, Jesus is often known to change people's names. Amen. <laughs> And uh, he's going to change Simon to Peter, but at this moment he is Peter and Andrew. They are the sons of Jonah. We know that from John chapter number 1. Um, John did write, the disciple John did write the book of John. Uh, there is sometimes easy to make the mistake because there's John right beside John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not write. John the disciple did write the book of John. We know that they were from Bethsaida of Galilee. We know they were fishermen by trade. We know, and this is very important, I want you to, to uh, note this if you miss half of the other things I say, note this. We know from Luke chapter number 5 that Simon and Andrew were business partners. They were 
uh, in a, as it were, a co-op with the other two brethren uh, that, that uh, are going to be recruited on this day. They are partners with James and John, and they are all four of them called into discipleship on the first day uh, of Jesus' uh, recruitment or his active calling for men to be his disciples. The four of these are all called on this, on this day. Uh, both of these brethren, Simon and Andrew, and I, this is a little detail I have known a few times and forgot a few times, and every time I, I, I read it, it's like, oh, that's right. Uh, they both of these brothers, Simon and and uh, Andrew knew Jesus through John the Baptist. Uh, the mentions that give us the scriptural con- confirmation of this um, is, is shown to us in John chapter number 1, uh, verses 35 through 42. You will see uh, the mention there. Uh, if you read further, some of the commentaries uh, that I uh, checked earlier, they think that it was about a year earlier. Uh, going by all of the, uh, when, when they actually line it all up, they think it was upwards of a year earlier that um, Simon, or Peter, and Andrew had met Jesus a year earlier. This may have been at the time when Paul, excuse me, John the Baptist points out to Jesus and makes those powerful statements that we will attribute to him for for all of time. Uh, He must increase, I must decrease. Uh, I'm not worthy to unlatch uh, his his shoe. Uh, hear ye him. Uh, that may have been the, uh, some type of an event like that, but however it happened, they knew Jesus through John the Baptist. Uh, it's interesting that the first two disciples that Jesus calls are both men who have been disciples of John the Baptist. It's, it's some people go from zero to sixty. Some people go from uh, not serving God to, you know, serving God full time with work to do, uh, zero to 60. Um, Other people have a progressive growth. I I would say it's much more common to see people have a progressive growth toward God, an opening of their understanding and an increase of their uh, nearness to anointing. Uh, I think that would be more common. But in this situation, I find it uh, notable that these two brethren had both been disciples of John the Baptist. And so these are the first two that Jesus call uh, in his call to discipleship. Andrew introduces Simon to Jesus. And uh, Jesus immediately calls him Cephas, which is Aramaic for uh, Peter, which is the Greek way of saying Cephas. You get it? Cephas, Peter, Greek, Aramaic. Uh, It means a rock or a small stone. Uh, they are both fish, fishing in the Sea of Galilee. They are. They had been washing their nets. Um, we, uh, Jesus, Jesus, um, and uh, has Simon take him out in a boat. This is the account in Luke five. Uh, in in Mark one, it's more concise. We don't know all of the details of it. We just know they were fishing there. Uh, in Luke five, you 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 read the story of Jesus asking Simon Peter. Uh, to take him out in his boat. Uh, what, six weeks ago, we, we, we preached a message, Jesus needs your boat, about that very moment. And the Lord asks Simon Peter to borrow his boat. They push out. He uses it as a pulpit. Cast your nets on the other side. A great miracle is wrought. You guys uh, know the story. Uh, this is this first moment. This is the, 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 the more detailed version in Luke chapter number 5. Jesus calls them to follow him, become fishers of of men. Now Simon, Peter, and Andrew are going to be selected by 12 others. Simon Peter, interestingly, is not just going to be a disciple, but he is going to be uh, an individual who is uniquely positioned and prepared to speak uh, at times when you should be speaking and at times when you shouldn't be speaking. (laughs) Uh, It seems like if you have a very uh, a very boisterous personality. It will at times be a gift to you. Uh, 
and it will times be a trial for you. Peter will live both of those stories. He's well known for his denial of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 14 or John 21. Both uh, stories tell his denial, and he's also known for his restoration. He is uh, considered not just by religious folks, but by uh, historians as the key figure in the first half of the book of Acts. We know he wrote two epistles in the in the New Testament. Andrew, his brother, had not near his social ability. Andrew Andrew does not seem to have near. I don't know if it's a social ability. I don't know if it's just confidence. I don't know if it's just the ability to open your mouth widely and stick your foot in it. Uh, Andrew was a much more, how, how shall we say it, a much more centered, kind of calm person, much more cautious, and yet he was instrumental in the building of the New Testament church. Um, we know know that uh, he is instrumental in introducing people to Jesus. For example, his brother in John, John chapter number 1, Mark chapter number 1. Uh, also, he is introducing people to Jesus in John chapter number 6. And he's introducing people to Jesus in John chapter number 12. Uh, let me very quickly point out the difference of someone who can be the spokesperson his brother Peter, and someone who can be the introduction, that's Andrew. Every group of people seeking to fulfill the work of God needs both kind of people uh, working in it. You say, I'm not as confident as these guys who just stand up and speak loudly like Brother Nathan. He just stands up and speaks loudly. Well, I do here. Uh, but, you know, I, I, some people just have that, 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 that strong, confident, social personality. I could point out a few of them here, like Brother Adam's that way. Uh, Brother Don's that way. Brother Larry's that way. They just can walk. They're just, they're, 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 uh, now they don't ever stick their foot in their mouth, though. That's the difference with them. They're just fine and exam. Anyway, moving along in a brisk manner. <laughs> uh, some people, you put them in a social setting, they excel. Brother David Martin excels in social settings. Uh, uh, other people have to make themselves work. You put me in a social setting, the first thing I'm going to do is try to back out of it. I hate that about myself. It has not been a friend to me. It has not even good for my calling and my work. Uh, but I have to catch myself and say, no, and I have to go back in and work the room. You understand what I mean? People have it naturally, and other people have to make it work. Now, here you see both. You see Peter, who is willing. Um, every time he goes to a, a meeting, he's the first one down laying hands on people in the altar. Uh, his brother Andrew, he's not quick to rush out in a situation to put himself in on, on view. Uh, Peter's always posing for the crowd. Andrew's always shaking his head at his brother. The point I want to say is this. In the group of unique men Jesus would choose, you have both of them. The Lord did not just choose boisterous social types. He also chose reflective, thoughtful types. So wherever you think you have or don't have in the work of God, I guarantee you, you'll find someone not too dissimilar from yourself, chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to be an example of uh, all the types of personality uh, that we have and oftentimes use as excuses. Now, can I have an amen? Uh, so uh, we have uh, just some real quick information on Peter here. Uh, we understand from other literature, this is not scripture, uh, this would be supporting literature, therefore one should not uh, view it with the same uh, uh, confidence you would view scripture, but these are uh, some things ideas, uh, some some truths we have from other sources. Uh, we believe Peter died a martyr in Rome about 67 AD, along with his wife, which is interesting. Um, his wife died with him. Uh, he was, uh, we are told from these other sources, crucified upside down at his own request, uh, claiming to be unworthy to die as the Lord Jesus Christ has died. His brother, however, uh, he, he also was crucified. He was crucified in Greece, uh, and he asked for a cross in the form of an X uh, in the same manner of his brother not wanting to be crucified 
uh, in the same manner that Jesus had been feeling unworthy. Uh, Peter was very much involved uh, in in the New Testament church. We have epistles to show his work. Uh, we have less about Andrew, but we do know that he was involved, according to other sources, uh, in the missionary work in Bithynia, Scythia, Greece, and Ephesus. Now, let's move to these other two brethren. After Jesus has called Simon Peter and Andrew, he walks a little bit further, and he finds James and John, both sons of Zebedee. Uh, mother was Salome, we know from Mark 16, Matthew 27. Many scholars believe, this is a little interesting deal, and we talked about this two or three weeks ago about in this beginning, it's so often for the Lord to let a family have a, a tremendous influence. And we see the same thing today. If you start a church, you go into community and you start a church, you will find there'll be one or two or three, maybe more families that are key to establishing and starting that church. And if they didn't believe in it, and if they didn't support it, uh, that church would not have near the chance to grow that it did. You see the same thing here. Here's some interesting uh, uh, consideration. Uh, many scholars believe that Salome was Mary's sister making these men Jesus' cousin. I hadn't heard about that. That's not something that you, you talk about a whole lot. It's, it's an interesting um, uh, little uh, point of, of thought. Uh, they were successful fishermen. They were not just guys on a pier with a bucket and a pole. Uh, they very much had a business going, and they had, we know, uh, I'll give you the facts you can der derive from Scripture. They had more than one boat. They had several boats. Uh, they were partners with Simon and Andrew, and they w at, were at a large, large enough uh, uh, business to have hired servants. We know we read the hired servants in verse 20 of chapter number 1. Also Luke 5, verses 10 and 11, hired servants are mentioned. In other words, they had uh, success. They had employees. Um, and you can see that although they were not the glitterati of their day, although they were not an educated elite, they were not without ability, and they were not without organization, and they were not without the ability to organize a thing and go and do it profitably. Um, these were the first four individuals called by the Lord, and they were successfully working in a successful business. Uh, and Jesus finds them there, mending their nets. These two brothers, uh, James and John, and uh, Simon Peter and Andrew, mending nets by the Sea of Galilee. Jesus calls them. They leave their father, Ze Zebedee, who is there. They, they leave their hired servants there with their father, and they go to do the work of the Lord. Evidently, their father continued uh, the business, and I'm sure they uh, might have been uh, at times involved a helping here or there, uh, but their primary focus was on being instructed uh, and being led and being taught by Jesus, Jesus Christ. Uh, James and John, and let me give you a few items about them, uh, they uh, had the title of the sons of thunder. Evidently, we know from Luke 9, they had a fiery temper. Uh, and we we see that see that shown in Mark chapter number nine. Also, uh, we see it shown in Luke chapter number nine. Uh, John tried to forbid one from casting out demons who did not follow them in Mark chapter number nine. In other words, somebody who was not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ saw the spiritual work they were doing and tried to become a uh, one who cast out demons, uh, uh, and and that did not go over very well with John. John. John was ready to put the beat down on him. Uh, yet these two brethren, along, interestingly, with Peter, but form an inner circle uh, with uh, the Lord Jesus, and they become the ones who, uh, they are there at uh, the Mount Transfiguration, and they're ambitious. Peter's ambitious, and Peter is bold. James and John, they're ambitious. Uh, they're not quite as bold as Peter, but they're pretty bold. They're almost like three hot shots, just ready to go forth and do something. Uh, they they both asked to sit at 
Christ's side in glory, Mark chapter number 10, and they both were rebuked for doing so. They both were interested, and I, I say this so you can see a little bit about personality. Um, they both were interested in uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, and they, we know in Mark 13, they asked the Lord specifically to get information about this. They both were there at, when Jesus appeared for the third time after his resurrection in Mark in John 21. We know from John 19, 20, 20, and 21 well, that, that, he, that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He does not name himself. Uh, we've talked about that in past uh, times. Um, John often went out to do ministry with Peter, Acts 3, Acts 8, Galatians 2. Uh, James, interestingly though, is the first apostle to be martyred for his faith. Uh, if you remember in Mark chapter number 10, uh, Jesus prophesied to James that he would drink the same cup as his master. Uh, this is referenced again in, uh, you can read the story in Acts 12 um, and also Mark chapter number 10 as I mentioned. John goes on to write his gospel. He writes three epistles and finally he gives us the book of Revelations. Uh, Zebedee, uh, this is again not scriptural sources, this is other sources I want to differentiate. Zebedee is of the house of Levi. Zebedee, their father, was uh, of the, the house that were both priests and worked and served in the temple, which means James and John could have come from the same line of those who worked in uh, the temple and served in the priesthood. Their mother, however, did not come from the house of Levi. Their mother came from the tribe of Judah. And so you have those servants of the Lord and you have those who praise the Lord. Uh, they're called the sons of thunder because they are of a priestly house and a royal house, some commentators say. Uh, James goes with Peter to a missionary trip to India. He preaches in Spain just prior to his death. John is thought to spend his la later years in Ephesus writing, uh, working at the churches there. And following his exile on the Isle of Patmos uh, because they had a hard time killing him. And you can read the story uh, in various places. He goes there banished. He dies around 98 A.D. Now, I've given you information on these brethren. Uh, there are two sets of two brethren. I, today I, I spend a lot of time, I, I, I try to see Scripture new. It's, I, I confess to you it's, it's not easy. Uh, for me, it's not easy. I, I try. It's so easy just to read your chapter, you know, check your box. It's so easy to just kind of go through it. I've heard these passages taught on and preached from from years, four years, and, and so have many of you. Uh, but to make it live, to make it new for me, I have to try to find uh, some, a perspective upon it that will let me see it in a different light. I don't reinterpret it. I don't change doctrine off of it. I just want to see something that I had not seen before. Others have seen it before. I have not seen it before. The reason why I enjoy doing this is if you do this, it forces you to spend time meditating upon the Word. You cannot read quickly through the Scripture and get a different perspective. You have to meditate upon the Word. You have to turn it over in your mind. You have to read it back to yourself. You have to quote it. And then sometimes when I'm stuck at that point, I'll go through the characters. Jesus is here. James is here. John's here. Peter's here. Andrew's here. How does it look from their perspective? And I try to look at the scripture from each of their character perspectives. This is not so much some secret tactic of study. It's not a secret tactic of study. Most of the preachers I know have been doing it for years. What it is, is a for me, is a four discipline not to just rush through the text, not just to grow through the chapters, not just to read, 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 yawn, yawn, nap time. It is for me an, a, a meditation of the word of the Lord. Upon his law I will meditate day and night. And I, I so this afternoon I will confess to you, full transparency, give me a, a few minutes more, I'm almost done. Uh, I will confess to you, 
I, I read this and I just read the text. And I read this and I just, I, I got the text. And I, I, I know I can do research and I research with pleasure. And I know I can get details. I do that with pleasure. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something to make it live to me as though I'm reading it the first time. And I, I was striking out big time. Full disclosure. It was just the disciples being called. And all of a sudden, I, I, in my thinking, this is, this is what I found new in my walk through the Scriptures. It's not a doctrine. It's not none of that. If you look at it that way, you miss the point. It's a, a meditation upon the Word of the Lord. The uniqueness of these brothers, the only thing I can find uh, at this particular juncture of study... What, what was there anything unique about these brethren? And I, I could not find it. Was there anything to care? I could not find it. No, finally, during the praise service, while we were singing some song, I, I, I got what I needed that made it new to me. And it's this. They weren't just brethren. They were brethren who could work together. Because I know lots of brethren who can't work together. Let me tell you a joke. <laughs> Older brother and a younger brother playing in the snow. Mom looks out the window at the back hill in the snow there. and She knows what's happening. It happens every day. One brother's taking advantage of the other one. She notices the younger brother, he pulls the sled to the top of the hill. The older brother... He rides the sled back down. It's hard to work with you, brother. She hollers out the window. You listen here, David Timothy. I mean, older brother. <laughs> you both are supposed to play with the sled. Not just one of you. You both play with the sled. And the older brother says... We are both playing with the sled. He plays with it on the way up the hill. I play with it on the way down. It's hard to work with your brother. No one knows how to push your brother, your buttons like your brother does. No one knows your secret insecurities like your brother does. If you have something about your personality, your appearance that, you, that is an embarrassment to you, your brother will wait till you are at the most vulnerable moment and then he will point it out for the girl you was trying to impress to see. Brothers can be hard to work with. Very few of us work with our brother. Very few businesses are brothers closely matched in age able to work together. I know a lot of brothers. I know some brothers who've tried to work together. And this is what you know about humanity if you spend any time observing this kind of a thing. Sometimes it can be hard to work with your brother. There is a thing about the fact that they know your strengths and your weaknesses and they can point them out. There's a thing going on, a sibling rivalry, where uh, there's an unspoken competition and you're still mad because one year he got the bike and you wanted it. All this baggage, sibling rivalry, competition, uh, perceived slights, grudges held in secret. All of these are realities of brothers. Uh, now, if you have a brother, uh, I hope and pray a day came when you both grew up. It's amazing how many I meet, and neither of them have ever grown up. They're still, you understand. Uh, but it's a great thing to, to leave all of that baggage behind. And there's a little secret about life. The first one to drop the baggage wins. It's a gift you give to yourself. Does that make sense? It can be hard to work with your brothers. And the one thing you see about these brethren that is kind of unique about them is they aren't just brethren where they know everybody's secrets and they know everybody's tendencies and they know everybody's problems. They're not just brethren. They're brethren who can work together. And before Jesus ever calls them, he looks down at them at the seashore. And you know what they're doing? They're working together.
In the Mark account, two of them are fishing and two of them are repairing nets. They already have a, a division of labor going on here. They're, you're a little better at this. You're a little better at that. And, and we'll just work together. And Jesus sees they can work together. And he calls two sets of two brothers. And they all are right there working together. It is a tremendous blessing to the work of God when you find spiritual brothers and spiritual sisters who can work together. Uh, this is not a small point. And I'm, I'm finishing. This is not a small point. This is a big point. People who can work together, even when you know the stuff there is to know, and you've heard all the jokes, and you know all the personality tendencies. Let me point this out. If you know anything about the nature of brothers, and you know anything about the nature of humanity, you've got to know that sometimes when Peter jumped up running his mouth, Andrew rolled his eyes... Wind him up and watch him go. <laughs> Come on, give me a good Pentecostal nod. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That is so siblings right there. And what Andrew really wants to say is, Peter, really, just once, could you be quiet? Just once, could you quit pretending the spotlight's on you? Just once, for the love of God, could you be seen and not heard? But no, you can't do it. If you have siblings, and that didn't resonate, you were way too Christian growing up. That's all I have to say. Your, your parents must have been intercessors, because if that doesn't resonate, you know your siblings inside and out, and they fight. you can see through all their machinations. They show up like, well, I'll let you borrow my, what do you want? You see through it. That, you know what? If, as we serve God uh, a long time with each other, as we journey in faith together, as we walk this way, you will start seeing tendencies in my personality. And there will be things that I do that just wear you out. And um, uh, hopefully I won't do them overly much. I, I am at times concerned about projecting my personality too much because I know no matter if you liked me at the beginning, a day might come that I just... You're just ready for me to stop. And I, let me apologize both for that in the past, which I have trespassed upon your kind indulgence. And let me apologize for the future trespasses that I will do upon your kind indulgence. And let me tell you, uh, there's something that Jesus likes about brethren who can work together. There's something Jesus likes about people who can know the insides and outs of each other and still work together. And that is the call for this hour for the church. We may know each other. We may be a little weary with each other at times. But, but can we work together? I say yes, we can work together. I say yes, we can work together. And so... These disciples are chosen. Sister Tony, you can come play a song about brethren getting along or something like that. Don't hit them anymore. That's a song I wrote for my brother. Don't knock me to the floor. Two themes, and I'll leave you with this. I'm giving you a holiday schedule tonight too, so... This is me not projecting my personality. <laughs> Two themes. If you look at the lives of Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they all give all. They all live sacrificial lives. You understand what I'm saying? They give sacrificially of themselves. They pay the ultimate price. And... This first theme from the choosing of them you will see if you look at their lives is that there is no effective following after Jesus if you are not willing to be baptized with the baptism he was baptized with in other words the first theme is sacrifice and we are blessed in many ways today we sit on padded pews and enjoy air conditioning thank God um, I imagine if the air conditioning went out our numbers would decrease you, you, you understand we're, we're blessed I thank God for it I, was not, I don't like being miserable, and you don't like being miserable, but we're blessed. But let's remind ourselves in all our comforts 
that the core of this thing, there is a cross of sacrifice. And if any man would come after me, Jesus says, let him deny himself. Let him take up a cross and let him follow me. That's the first theme. Uh, the second theme that jumps out at you from this, lo- from this story of him calling these brothers is that uh, when Jesus, at the very beginning, from the outset, from the first moment, he makes clear the duty that will be upon them. And that is they will become fishers of men. In other words, there is a purpose in this ministry that is not just to gather crowds. It's not just to argue with uh, lawyers and priests. It's not just to in some way attain uh, religious celebrity status in a region of the country. There's a central purpose and theme from the very beginning. And that is this. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. I will make you fishers of men. If there are anyone who claims to be disciples and you don't find the themes in their life of sacrifice and the themes of reaching the lost, I'm not so sure that they're exactly where they ought to be in their supposed discipleship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because these themes are from the very beginning. Sacrifice, and seek the lost fishers of men reaching for people making a difference making a difference in Jesus name let's all stand hallelujah Lord Jesus would you let there be a great unity among you are listening to apostolic radio Charlotte Truth with the power to live it.